everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Catch That with Naturally Elise and JR. And today we have a guest that we're super excited about. We are hanging out with Mark Chappelle, and why it's so special is he's our friend. They're a very good friend, mm-hmm. allegedly. Um, so... <laughs> So just to tell you um, who Mark is, he's a Los Angeles-based writer, graphic designer, singer, and musician. He, his mother claims that as a toddler that he was always disassembling record players with a screwdriver, and he still uses every tool to get inside the music. That's some good writing right there. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Usually reading about it, sometimes writing and recording it, many times marketing and packaging it often critiquing or advocating for it, always collecting it. Mark's love of music begins with R&B, jazz and gospel. It splays outward into the neighboring areas of pop, dance, hip hop, rock, folk, and the cross sections between them. Special reverence is reserved for Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, Shaka Khan, Q-Tip, Prince, and Joni Mitchell, who can virtually do no wrong. Welcome, Mark Chappelle. Hey, Elise. Hey, Jr. Hey. This is great. Hey. Oh, please don't take advantage of it. Oh, my God. <laughs> to make no promises. <laughs> That's fair. That's totally fair. Oh, man. I deserve whatever y'all going to give me, so let's just come on. All right. <laughs> We got this. Yeah, of course. Yes. Of course. Of course. Yeah, so Jr. tell them... Um, Tell the folks what we're going to kind of get into and talk about today. And Okay, so if y'all can see what's behind Elise, we're going to talk about that special album because we know it means a lot to Mark. A lot. And I mean a lot. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that and just bug out with him because we know Mark very well. Um, we have a crew, which is our INA crew. Shout out to everybody in the crew, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we just some crazy music folk that love, like, love music down. We analyze it. We know everything. We read line of notes, if y'all can see that. <laughs> we do all that. And um, we actually, our first time all meeting each other, we went to Colorado. And what an adventure that is. These people here, y'all, they crazy. They are crazy. I don't know where I met them from, but they are crazy. But I love them because <laughs> I'm just as crazy as they are. So, <laughs> you know, watch allegedly. it. Watch are we it. Crazy together tonight? <laughs> yes, we are. Yes. All together. Together, <laughs> JR. <laughs> together. <laughs> so, so since we know we're going to be talking about um, what you're going to do for me, we kind of want to talk about kind of Shaka's progress to that album. So we know she started with Rufus and all that good stuff. But what do you feel about her, Mark? Why is Shaka a favorite for you? Wow. Well, OK, so I think I heard her say in an interview once that she went to a voice doctor And the doctor told her that there's like a mutation in in her where um, her voice has an extra cavernous part of her her voice that just makes everything louder. And like, if it was just about loud, that'd be it. But like, she just has this voice that you can't really duplicate. And uh, like you hear it and it's like, wow, what is that? I need to know more about that. I need to come closer to that. So I think my first time hearing her was I Feel For You, which of course, you know, everybody knows that song and like, okay, I like the beat, I like the rap, all right, this is cool. Um, I'm like, all right, this voice, there's a whole bunch of things. And I think when you realize that you have a soul, something calls to it and you're like, oh, oh, whatever language you speak in, I understood that. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Shaka has that for a whole bunch of people. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if you speak English or not. Like, she can sing something from her soul, and people in Japan will get it. With yeah. her getting with Rufus, because I think me and Sis was talking about this maybe a couple weeks ago. You think if she would have started off solo first, it would have been, she would have been as big as she is? Well... Probably, probably, because what it is, is when you have 
a really talented member of any group, mm -hmm. um, people who know how music makes money find out what makes money and they find a way to make that make them money. So even if she hadn't gotten with Rufus, she probably would have ended up somewhere. She might have taken a circuitous route to get there. But it's one of those things where she has such an advanced gift and such a unique voice that uh, she kind of carved her own lane. So even though there's artists that maybe like Tata Vega has some things in common with her, um, you know, once you got to the 80s, most of her backup singers were people who were kind of um, in her shadow, in her vein, the, like Vesta Williams, uh, Sandra St. Victor, they had something in common with that. Um, but Shaka came out and I think she was doing that first. And like, I have to give respect though, because when Shaka was coming up, they called her little Aretha. So like, if it wasn't for Aretha coming through, like people probably wouldn't know what to do with Shaka Khan. But with that lane being open, now you got Shaka and, and she's opened it up for everyone else since then. I think she would have found her way for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. See, okay. I had I had the opposite thinking. Um, I think during the time of Rufus, of just with her being the band kind of set her apart and people kind of paid attention to it in a different way because it was a lot of comp right then of some of, you know, of our greatest singers of our time all out at the same time. And I, I mean, I just kind of was thinking that it could have been possible for her to have been overlooked just because of the pool. I, I agree with you there. So like, I, I feel like I want to split the difference between my answer and yours now. Cause when it comes down to it, you know, the first Rufus album was great but it didn't have like a huge hit on it. It's just kind of like, oh, you know, we like this multiracial band. Okay, the girl singer, she's really good. She's cute. All right, she got the hips and the, the lips and all right, cool. Um, but until they had Tell Me Something Good, people weren't really paying attention to Rufus. Right. Um, I don't know if she would have been able to get something like that. I, I, I don't know if this is the case, but she did, um, sorry, they did a remake of Stevie Wonder's Maybe Your Baby on the first album. Mm -hmm. I feel like that might have gotten Stevie Wonder's attention, like, oh, who's this chick doing my song like that? Um, so I don't know if that's how they came around, but, mm, you know, finding a way to get the ear of somebody like that who can write a song with her, um, like, tell, tell me something good, um, probably helped touch things off. But again, like, with a band behind her, it probably helped her stand out for sure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with you. All right, you you right. You know, Ooh, we gotta put this down. What? Allegedly, allegedly. You know, let me get this notarized. This is yes. This yeah, is I can't say nice things about Elise because it'll go straight to her head. She'll be thinking she's cute and smart and likable and whatnot, and people won't be here. Oh, wait a minute, that's next. Year. Anyway, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I'm just going to, um, just because I mentioned about it just being a lot of people out at that time, but let's, we'll also talk about the the time when what you're going to do for me about kind of what else was out at that time, just okay. to give um, people some context. Okay. So, like, the best charting singles of 81 were, you had Cool in the Gangs, uh, you had Lakeside, Gap Band. Yarborough and Peoples, Smokey Robinson, A Taste of Honey, Ray Parker Jr., Shaka, um, Rick James, Evelyn Champagne King, Diana Ross, Lionel Richie, Four Tops, Luther Vandross, um, Roger, Tri Roger Tripman, um, Earth, Wind & Fire. That was 81. It was kind of all over the place. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say, too, because I'm like, we just came out of this disco where it wasn't hot anymore and right. it was like we're going into this new wave and now it was like everybody is like we don't know what the sound is so everybody was kind of like everywhere with it because you could see that bunch right there it was like okay you hear the kashif sound you hear the earth wind and fire sound you hear the cooling again you hear this it was no distinct sound then yeah. and then you know and roger troutman doing new stuff you know you know so had the clubs gotten big yet on Roger in 81? Or was it just like baby zap? <laughs> oh, I mean, it, I mean, it's baby zap, basically. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, You're not going to find a bigger clap, though. Like, even when it was a baby, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, 
and with that, with that being said, since now we can go on to what you're gonna do for me. So, yeah, Mark, why do you love this album so much? Explain, please, to the people. It's hard to explain, but I've been trying for a minute. Uh, so this is this is my little theory, right? Okay. So um, everybody was around for like Michael Jackson Thriller knows it was just like the album. But people who were around for a while know they're like, yeah, Thriller was dope, but off the wall, though. So my theory is that what you're going to do for me with Shock is off the wall. Now, people came through like and were buying I Feel For You like crazy because of the singles and like Through the Fire, great song. Um, even like If This Is My Night was like the, the kind of forgotten song. That song is dope. Like when you're filler and whatnot, uh, your, your other singers, your also rings are, are uh, that good. It's like, oh, OK, that's great. But what you're gonna do for me is one of those albums where you can drop the needle anywhere and really, really love the song. Um, and I feel perhaps I feel for you had some problems because they had to make it commercial. Like Shaka did not want the rapper on there, and she didn't want all like the cuts and DJ scratches and whatnot. That was probably oh yeah, this is why you can't come up in our ear saying Shaka Shaka. Kind of like no, 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 you don't want to do that. N not mad when you're alive. Um, <laughs> And he, he says that today, like in, in interviews, like, <laughs> wow. but then like said, hey, I have a surprise for you. And then he played the Shaka 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 Khan, Shaka Khan. And she was like, what is that? Nah, if it was up to her, we wouldn't have had that, com you know, that <laughs> combination of R&B and rap happening. I'd be like, no, this is going to be big. You got to trust me. And like, of course, I'm sure she's glad for like the success of it, what it did for a career carrying that forward. But yeah, the song itself, even now, you know, you don't hear like Melly Mel on her TV track. I don't. I don't think she just does this song. <laughs> right. Mm. So you. So you feel like her off the wall was is this. So then, how do you feel about clouds? I mean, naughty. Sorry. Well, see, naughty is a different conversation. Uh, naughty. Um, I call it the middle child because okay. disco had just ended while they were making the album. Right. And so uh, this is it. Uh, so she came uh, through with I'm Every Woman, and that was a huge hit. Of course, what do they want to do? They want to duplicate that. So they bring Ashford and Simpson back, and it's the first song of the album. It's the first single, um, and it does something, but it doesn't do the same thing that I'm Every Woman was. Mm -hmm. What it was is she was kind of caught in the middle. They didn't necessarily know where the sound was going. You know, they pretty much were doing like an album every year, every two years at that point. Um, like even in her autobiography, she's just kind of like, oh, we did Naughty, you know, it did what it was going to do. And then we're like, next, right on to the next one. They weren't dwelling on it. Like whatever was there and brilliant, they were just like, it's cool. Like the Beatles used to do stuff like that, like do genius things. And then like, if it wasn't like exactly what they wanted, they threw it in the garbage. And like some people would kill for that stuff. There were great things like that on Naughty. But what was happening there was like R&B was getting more electric. There's more synthesizers and, and like funk was changing. Disco was changing. Boogie was coming through. And um, it's like Naughty wasn't, um, it was not a bad album at all. But if you looked at what the number one songs were for that year, like in 1980, like everything was very, very electric. Every, everything was kind of spacey and like the fashion was getting more shiny and that they were doing that kind of thing. Um, Naughty didn't have anything like that on there. And, and what you're going to do for me didn't necessarily go in that direction. But um, it definitely got more refined. And it took the things that were working from Naughty and perfected it. Whew. Well, so let me tell you, me and JR conversation um, we had about, um, I feel like what you're going to do for me sounds like one of the Rufus albums. And that's not a bad thing. I love the Rufus album. So that's a very good thing to me. But um, the sequence of the albums, it kind of felt like what you're going to do for me came out. And then they tried to find more 80 sound and then came yeah. out with Naughty. And then Naughty, be like, no, we got to do some more. And then they went back to Shaka Khan. And it's like, well, if, I would, if someone would have had me listen to him and I had never heard him before, I would think that was the order. Really? Right. And I agree with that because I think, and like I agree with her with that because I think what you're going to do for me kind of sounds like Master Jam to me. It's like a the next thing to me. So, like a, like a more mature Master Jam. Yeah. Master yeah. Jam, of course, with Quincy Jones at the helm was very slick, as was what you're going to do for me. 
I would say like, okay, now I think we all know that average white band was pretty much backing her up for a bunch of these albums. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though they had that sound pretty much on lock, I was like, yeah, there was a certain sheen to it that is, was there like when you're not, well, I don't even want to take that away from them because like there were some badass players. So, yeah. um, <laughs> but what you're going to do for me, um, Shaka took this very, um, let's say, composed arrangement because like all the arrangements were very, very tight. Um, it was really well produced, but she is like the energy behind it that gives it all the, the soul. Right. So like the band gave her like a nice solid uh, bass. And then of course, when you have, what is it? Night in Tunisia with like the players like Herbie Hancock and Dizzy Gillespie. I'm not counting them as part of the band per se because they're like featured guests. Yeah. Um, but Shaka was the driving force on, on that. Like the way she changed the songs and a lot of the songs had previously been done by other artists. I didn't realize how many of them were, were covers. Um, but the way she did them, it blackened them up like, well, basically that, that's how a Rufus album would work. Like they were, they were counting on her to bring that because it, I mean, they did albums without her. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't listened to many of the Rufus albums without Shaka. <laughs> Probably the reason why we don't talk about them as much. <laughs> because there's just a thing that she has that yeah. if you could just switch her out for some other artist, <clears throat> They probably would. And then, particularly when they got to fighting and whatnot, because you know there were some bows thrown. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Shock was on nobody's pushover. So I've they, listened. <laughs> I've actually listened to Rufus uh, albums without Shaka. And I mean, they don't really feature singers on those albums. So you're getting the same music. So you're just like, oh, some instrumental Shaka. <laughs> <laughs> Because when what you got to do for what you what you gonna do for me Ooh. came out, Rufus put out a solo album that year. Put mm -hmm. out their album that same year. Put out an album that same year. I feel like I should know that. Is it "Party to Your Broke" or "Seal and Red"? Party to your broke. Party to your broke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> me and Elise was like, were they throwing shade? <laughs> uh, I mean, at least they didn't call the album "One Monkey Don't Stop No Show." That's Ooh. shit. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is that a hidden message? No, it's not a hidden message. <laughs> it is right here, <laughs> just for you. <laughs> oh my god! Oh man! So, with that, what is your favorites on the album? Hmm. The hardest question. Let me consult a <laughs> source. <laughs> Oh God. Okay, so this is what's hard because I feel like I've played Papillon the most, and that's from uh, like Naughty. So like I have to take that out of the running. What do I play the most? This is what's hard. Um from Naughty, I play Papillon like all the time. It just stays on repeat because it's just a really feel-good thing. Mm -hmm. But with what you're gonna do for me, I actually play the whole album. Like the whole album has pretty much equal plays all in iTunes. However, <laughs> There's something about Heed the Warning, the song that she wrote with her brother. I love that. Um, uh. just, it just has this driving like thing to it that um, it's a little bit uh, a le little bit electronic, which was kind of new wave for the time. That was something that Naughty didn't have. Like that's the kind of thing that comes into what you're gonna do for me. That's like okay, so the club's like this. We're gonna do a little bit more of this. I thought, I love this song. How come it wasn't a single? And then I started reading and found out it actually was the single in the UK. That's what they rocked with first. Really? Didn't know that. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mark, okay, dropping jewels. Oh. <laughs> JR, what's, what's your favorite on the album, JR? I have two, actually. I got, um, we got each other. And uh, I know you, I live you. Those are my two favorites. Yeah. I love those because Larry Will Williams is killing those horns and I'm a horn dude. And the way he's going in on that sax, oh my God. I'm like, 
The and horn. the way Shaka is blowing on that, doing the... Whew, I was listening to We Got Each Other on the way home, and that joke was sounding right in my car. I was like, oh! Whew. I don't understand... I don't understand why that wasn't a single. Like, Me that song jammed so hard. Like, when it comes in with the beat to start with, I'm like, I don't, like, this seems like it wanted to be on a dance floor, and y'all didn't lead with this? Y'all let this sit on the bench? All right. I don't understand. I don't either. Yeah. My my favorites, and actually one of my favorite all-time songs is uh, I Know You, I Live You. Um, it just makes me, it makes my cold heart just melt, and yeah. It's... Was your heart ever really cold? Oh, God. <laughs> Now, you know you was born smiling. Stop lying. <laughs> See? But then, that just proves my point. But then my <laughs> other song is me, me and our sis Renee's song, Night Moves. Why? It's because she sings deep. Yes. <laughs> I am friends. <laughs> okay. So if you love that song, give me like a side uh, uh, thing to, to talk about Rasan Patterson's April's Kiss. Let's talk about it right now. What is that look on your face? Oh, no, no, no. I'm like, whoa, he went that way. I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, no, I said we can talk about that right yes, now. Yes, I'm like, okay. I'm like, because you, you got to know about the jam. you got Because I know y'all be in them stacks, in them crates. Mm -hmm. um, the way he took the, the vibe of Night Moods, and like, that's my kind of tribute there, where it's like, all right, it's not sampling it per se. Like, you know, you do get the... I love it. I love it. No. But it's not like, you know, it's not like he has to pay somebody. He probably could, but you know, it, it's not that. It's like, oh, he understands what made Night Moods amazing. Yeah. And he did a tribute to that. I love that because that's one of those things you're like, wait a minute. If you don't know, okay, wait, I have to rock to it like that. <laughs> fans would understand <laughs> yeah yeah and actually um it's it's kind of great that you brought that up because we we talked a lot about Rasan with our last guest um so like no this is like all coming together that dude is amazing and, what yeah, I and that's why Shaka love him because yeah. you know she did that Vlad interview with Lou Nail lord have mercy <laughs> and, <laughs> Look, and she was like the only what what you say a couple of people were mad about that interview, but I really loved it. I, really I thought loved it. it was funny. I was here for it. Because Shaka was being herself, and you know Lunell. You know that. <laughs> so The thing that I can trust with Shaka Khan is that she's going to say exactly what the hell she means. Yes. And you're going to feel how you feel about it, which you are allowed to, but it doesn't change the thing that she said. And right. she is old enough and established enough that she can say it with all the bass, all the chest. And you just have to be like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, you got to eat it. That's right. You got to eat it. You got to eat it. Yeah. That's why Rasan was probably happy in that interview because she was like, I will, she, I think she said the only person she would do a song with would, would be him. And that's why he, he put it up on his Instagram. And I was like, ah. <laughs> I, I love seeing people that I'm a huge fan of, like mm -hmm. fan out over somebody. It's cute. It's the cutest thing ever. Absolutely. Because everybody's a fan. It's just, you know, if you get somebody in the room, they might try to act like they're not, like, geeking out. But they know they are. Don't lie. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Rasan is huge on her. For real, for real. Like, I, have they ever done a song with each other? They actually have. It just wasn't released. Oh. There's a song called Sunday that I think Rasan put out on his SoundCloud that they uh, recorded in... in Probably did around like 95, 96, around the time of like uh, Dairy to Love Me. I could be making that up. Don't quote me. Um, but he just put it out one day like, oh, here's just something me and Shaka did together. And I'm like, you just have a whole Shaka song chilling at your house with <laughs> layer dust on it. And you're going to wait 20 something years to be like, oh, oops, that just came out. What? And it's probably some other stuff we don't even know about because I know she's going to work with a lot of people. Oh, like over the last 10 years or so, but it has only put out like a couple of singles, like the Beast Laid song, which like I love the multiple versions of that. And then uh, people have things to say about Hello Happiness. I love that album. I really I do. I do too. 
People and she, I wasn't sure what to do with it at first because I'm like, wait a minute, this ain't the shock I know. Exactly. And she has switched it up on you a couple times. You should be used to it by now. Don't ask right. me. <laughs> I don't understand why people, I saw like people like really shitting on that album. I'm like, how? Like, well, you know, if you just want another sweet thing, there's only one. So you're not going to get that. If you want another I feel for you, the, the I feel for you has been done like none other can be done. It exists. And like, as an artist, it would suck to have to do your, the stuff to people like over and over and over again. If you want to do that, cool. You know, and if your audience buys it, cool, keep doing it. But if you're an artist like, okay, I want to do this, like I'm able to reach here, I want to do that. How long do you have to keep making the same kind of album people hear before you can branch out and do something else? So yeah, I love what you're going to do for me. But if the next album doesn't sound like that, I have what you're going to do for me. <laughs> Right. And, and, and yeah, we talked about this when we talked to Zoe, we said the same thing, like people want to keep their artists in a box, but it's like, you have been a fan of me, trust me where I'm going and come and, and see if you like that too. But like I you said, you, you can know. always go back and yeah. listen to, they, they exist in perpetuity. You can enjoy it forever. Which is interesting though, because now it makes me think about when people will hear an album maybe listen to it for a couple of months and then you don't hear about it. It's like six months later, that album is old and you got to put out another EP. Mm -hmm. What is it that where we don't actually cherish albums as long as we used to, like this, the attention span for music is getting shorter. Yeah. And I don't know what's going on. Cause like you can have great music but people will be like, oh, that's great. What else you got? <laughs> no, hold up. <laughs> well, right. one reason for that is I don't know. I guess back then you kind of were limited to how much music you could even get at one time as far as a whole album because you either had to buy it or you had to right. borrow it or so when you got it, you cherished it. Like I think of CDs that I got in the 90s to where I would play stuff over and over even if it wasn't good. See, that's a that's the point right there because CDs cost $18 I was half broke at the time. So whatever was on there, we was going to make that jam. You ain't uh, lying. You ain't <laughs> lying. So, yeah, I think of that. It's 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 just that issue. Now it's too available. It's like, it's one thing when you got three choices of things to eat and whether you got a whole cheesecake factory book. But the, you, know, you had the three yeah, things, you're like, boom. You book to choose from, yeah. You're going to savor it because, you know. Oh, it all, I'm sorry. People don't know what phone books are anymore. Yeah. Can you edit that out so I don't seem old, even even though I'm old? <laughs> <laughs> but it but it being in that digital space and not tangible, yeah. you don't cherish it the same. It's more, it's more disposable, and that's the case not just for music, just consumption of everything. Yeah, this is true. So streaming is really nothing out special on. anymore. Um, in a way, yeah. And, and if you, I mean, it's almost like dating too, because like, if it doesn't work out, you can swipe and find somebody else. Oh, that doesn't work out. Swipe and find somebody else. Um, we'll do that with music. So like, even if I like this, uh, if I get bored, I'll just swipe and find something else to listen to. People are not used to going back to like, oh, wow, I still like this song from 2015. They'd be like, wow, that is so old. I wasn't even in high school then. <laughs> right right that because i'm thinking because i'm thinking about like radios and radio in the 90s before you know before your radio ones and such you know took over and all that mm -hmm. like it was it wasn't unusual to hear them playing a song that came out the year before in regular rotation that's true a song that wasn't even on the charts anymore but it's just like a favorite and they still yeah. would play it. And it was no big deal. No, I'm, I'm amazed when stuff happens like that Lizzo hit with Truth Hurts that was like a year and some change old, had been out, had video already yeah. and like didn't really do anything. I forget what happened and how it ended up blowing up. But like when it caught on, it's like people didn't even notice that it was technically an old song because it had been out for a year plus. Um, I mean, but if the music is really great, I know tastes change often, um, but they essentially trying to hit the same spots. Like I was talking about it, like grabbing your soul. That's really like the goal. So if it still can do that, 
it's still relevant. Mm. Mm-hmm. I can agree to that. Yeah. I can agree to that. But but it's but what happened with her is not a common thing in the music industry, especially not for black artists. But what do you mean what happened to her? Because so many things have happened. No, that that a song was able to cook that long and still blow up. Oh, yeah, uh, that, that's amazing. Like I would love to see it happen again, but I know to keep my my expectations low. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you don't get. It's very rare you get the slow burn artists anymore. No, they're still there, but I mean, as far as mainstream and, and pop culture wise. Like, oh yeah, like I don't know if there even is in our department anywhere, if there is a label, it's all everybody doing their own thing, independence. And, and it shows. It absolutely shows, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, it's like RCA, Universal, I think, Capital, and then I don't know if there really are any majors really playing anymore. Like it's, everybody's kind of independent now. This is sad, this is sad. So, so with that being said, and this album, you know, what you're going to do for me, right? And right. we're looking down like Shaka's like hits. Shaka don't have a lot of big pop hits. I did not know this, though. Well, she doesn't. Um, however, I think Through the Fire was huge. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, that's a one, that's a hard song to sing. I went to a Shaka show, show once where she didn't do Through the Fire or I Feel For You. And can I tell you, I was really relieved. I love those songs, but after all this time, I want to hear some of the other great things she's been doing. The great thing about quarantine is that she started doing those. Um, like for the, the fans that love those songs, it doesn't have to be the big pop hits. Like everybody knows Ain't Nobody and I'm Every Woman. They're such huge hits, she doesn't really need to have a whole bunch of them. Yeah. But she still has to work because she's a Black woman, so. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, when I, yeah, because when I saw her, she didn't, she did the only one of those like big big songs was she didn't do through the fire she just she did ain't uh, can't nobody she did ain't nobody that's the mm. only like big you know one of those shit. songs everything else she did were i mean to me they're popular songs but to everybody else it's an album cut but i'm just like oh shit you know <laughs> Well, this is the thing, like, Ain't Nobody, I'm Every Woman, I Feel For You, those are the songs that everybody knows. So if you have to sing in front of a crowd, it's going to get most of the crowd going. That's cool. But the things that made them love those songs, it's not like those were the only songs that had that quality. That's all mm-hmm. through her discography. Like, that thing that Shaka can do to a song, like, she was taking other people's songs and making them do what they do, like Aretha would have. Like, Aretha would Aretha buy a song, Shaka Shaka buys it. I agree, because I think what she did with uh, We Can Work It Out, how she opens the album. The, I love it. That's my favorite version, to be honest with you, because I don't like the Beatles version at all. So just saying. Yeah. And then I do I do like Stevie. Stevie's is cool. You know what I'm saying? Stevie's is cool. But the way Shaka did it, it was like, this is how you open an album. You know what I'm saying? And even yeah. in the remake, like, this is how you do it. And she bodied it. Like, I have to listen to that a couple of times before I even go to what you're going to do for me because I love her version of it. I think she bodied that. She shocked it. <laughs> for real. All I have to say about that song is I've always thought that it's a crime. Dirty, 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 dirty. How is it the way she says that makes me want to slap somebody who's near and dear to me? Every time I'm like, I, what is that? That Oh, my God. It's just mind-blowing. And I hate being wordless because I'm like, that's just, it's the feeling I get from it. But I'd be trying to convey and, and like push that feeling into words, like why it's amazing. It's like the song is is a horse that she's riding. And and like the way her ad libs are, it's just like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Yes. Oh shit, it's going. <laughs> I don't even want it to end because you kind of, you see how it ends like abrupt, like it just ends. And I'm like, no, <laughs> why? With them being that close to the disco age, I wish there were more extended versions of those songs because there were things that were danceable in there. There were like bass lines that just really like give it to you. Um, I, I just felt like that album was here and then it was gone. And it like, it, it actually got nominated for a Grammy. It didn't win that year. But like, What You're Gonna Do For Me was a number one song. Like I didn't realize that it was that big until after the fact, I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I thought I was just the one that liked it. Clearly, somebody agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. 
Yeah, because when the song that was number one right before What You're Gonna Do For Me was Ray Parker Jr., A Woman A Woman Needs Love. A Woman Needs like Love, you do. yeah. And that mm. for a couple of weeks. And then the song right after What You're Gonna Do For Me was Rick James' Give It To Me, Baby, came right after, wow. after that. So it was wedged between those two, yeah. I, I mean, the so charts me. were male dominated in for that particular year, as far as the R, you know, R and B goes. Because I know, I know, probably Rick James was probably owning eighty one with street songs, right? Right. Good. Yeah, because uh, "Give It to Me, Baby" stayed on the number one from June thirteenth through July eleventh of that Damn. year. So, oh, so five, six weeks on the chart. So that was a juggernaut. Um, you know, it's funny that it took getting to something like um, I Feel For You to maybe duplicate the bigness of I'm Every Woman. Between then, she just had like lowercase h hits, not capital H hits. Right, right, right. right. It's just like people, you know, of course they want to be like, well, you know, how many did she sell? Um, like, you know, how high did it go on the charts? You also have to keep in mind there are a lot of times where like black artists just weren't pushed on the pop charts. That's right. Um, did you see Frankie Beverly and Mays anywhere on the Billboard 200? Nope. Nope. Um, like the SOS band, uh, they had like big R&B hits. They were doing the same thing as Janet Jackson was. Well, not the same thing, but you know, they both had the flight time sound that year. Um, but Janet was all on the R&B and pop charts. SOS band, very black, very on the left. I don't think Shaka ever really wanted to play that game of being a crossover artist because she's always who she is. Yes. When I Feel For You was as big as it is, it's like nobody had a song that sounded like that. Like Prince's version didn't sound like it. You know how many people did that song? How many? How many? The Pointer Sister did the version of I Feel For You before Shaka. Yeah. Reby Jackson did a version of I Feel For You on the Centipede album. That happened. Yup. You know what? I have I have this in, I have that album, and I don't know if I've ever really listened to it. And I actually have it. Both of those versions sounded like Prince's version, okay. and Prince's version was it was cool for yeah 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 around the house basically. Like it's it's a song everybody likes, but like it became huge with Shaka, and I think that made them both bigger because like oh wait it's the Prince song, but Shaka's doing it like this, and then it's it was huge with being you know. Wait a minute, was it on Break In or, or what? Yeah. Because I don't want a big break dancing song. Like, it was just perfect for the time. And 84 was huge for dance music. That was, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. I keep trying to just talk about what you're going to do for me, but, but Shaka is everywhere. Oh, no. I love no, no, no. Shaka. That, that, was, that, was just, that, that was just the core. You can branch out. Yeah. yeah. I think when you have a song that's huge, like I Feel For You, um, it became popular to everybody so yeah be, you know in white spaces it means shaka is going to be on i don't know if she was on american bandstand also um but yeah it, it got you know a grammy for which she thanked them all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you is it thank you so don't don't do my girl shady <laughs> um but like that was a, that's such a big hit that they couldn't ignore it so yeah it brought those audiences to her rather than her trying to go to those audiences. I would have thought that, like, thinking about and, and listening, because I was listening to the album today, because it's actually my second favorite Shaka album, to be honest. And I was listening to it, and I was like, I don't understand why this wasn't a bigger album, to be honest with you. Like, if you think about it, this, you, you think, because I was thinking about this today, do you think, like, Quincy Jones and Michael and them was listening to what you're going to do for me and got a little bit of inspiration for Thriller? You know, I couldn't say that they didn't because um, anybody who was big, like they're in the marketplace, they're defining the culture at that moment. So mm -hmm. like anybody who wants to come in and like be respected has to know what's going on and respond to it. Right. You, know, you, you can't like throw out like a, just a, like a, a number card when somebody ever got the big joker. You, you better come with something. Yeah. So oh, I don't I don't know because honestly, like I, I'd be looking for things from that era that had the same sound. Um, did you ever listen to Aretha's Love All the Hurt Away album? Yes. 
like Arif Mardin uh, produced that. I think it came out the same year as What You're Gonna Do For Me. It mm-hmm. doesn't sound like What You're Gonna Do For Me. And I had hoped that it did, because I know uh, some of that sound was present on the Aretha album the year prior when she did um, What a Fool Believes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I would say it's What You're Gonna Do For Me like, so they're probably employing similar players, um, similar arrangements, and like, Aretha killed that like nobody can. Like technically, Michael McDonald probably should leave his own song alone after Aretha. <laughs> <laughs> it's just safer. True that. True that. True that. <laughs> um, but I was I was hoping to find like some of that other stuff um, with Aretha Mardin and like the other players like duplicated elsewhere because I I love the sound and I love Shaka. So putting them together is part of what made that my favorite album. Because I was feeling like when you said the whole off the wall and thriller thing, I now when I listen to Naughty, it sounds very analog to me. Oh, and yeah. And what you're going to do for me sounds very digital to me. Like the sound is completely different. That's why I was just like, maybe what you're going to do for me is her thriller, but the way you broke it down, it does make sense that it's kind of off the wall, though. See, I don't, hear, I don't hear what you're going to do for me the same way y'all hear it. Tell me about it. Yes. It's this heavy digital sound that y'all are hearing, I'm not hearing it in the extent well, of y'all are saying. The song or the album? The album. I'm not getting that same feel. It, well, it's not heavy digital. It's just yeah, because it doesn't everything. feel modern to me in that way. It's so that's why I say it just sounds like a Rufus album, like a like a like a like a more polished. Rufus album, but it still sounds, it still has that sound to me. Well, that spirit, I should say. Okay, l- let me let me try for a hot take because I'm tired of being good. Um, Don't be good. Polished is the antithesis of Rufus. You said Rufus, what? I said polished is the antithesis of Rufus. No, I know. I'm t- yeah. So like bringing Quincy Jones in almost made it almost like a non-Rufus album in that sense. Because like you always single out Master Jam as like, oh, wait a minute. No, that's the Quincy Jones one. It wasn't like, oh, it's a repeat of Ask Rufus. Oh, it's another street player. Yeah, it's really its own thing. Right. right. And right. thank you for it because do you love what you feel is that, mm. <laughs> but um, I feel for you was really the digital one. Uh, Maybe I'm using the wrong words. Oh, no, 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 no. Because no. I mean, I, I would go with it. Now, okay. are you saying like, I think in Elisa's sense, um, Naughty was very much an analog album. The only thing that was electronic about it is like, there's an electronic violin solo on All Nights All Right. Right. That was kind of weird. It's not my favorite song. Mm -hmm. Okay, don't tell nobody this, right? But I found out that was a cover. And I like the original better than I like Shaka's version. Oh, wait, who? I'd have to look it up. Hold on a second. I did not know that was a cover. Mark is going to consult the Googles. Yeah, I mean, what? Yo, I did not know that. Wow. The thing, that electronic violin, I was not here for it. But no, the me. The original thing that, okay, see, the original artist was Honey White and the Nightman. I don't know who that is, but if you find that song, of like the original version on YouTube, mm-hmm. um, it has things that came together better for whichever vocals they had. I think it might've been a white woman singing. I don't even remember, honestly. But I just know I like the general composition of that better. Um, but with Shaka, it's like, this seems like the, the, the violin wasn't like, it wasn't working with her, it was competing with her. It's like, like, um, like Shaka's voice is kind of like a horn. Um, and, and it was kind of like, okay, I don't know what to do with this. It's occupying the same frequency. It didn't work for me. Now she brought the vocal like she should have. I think if we were in the area of remixes, that also could have been like an amazing song if it were worked differently. But I don't think they did that then. It's just like, okay, we came in, like we had the charts, we played it, we did the take, maybe we did a couple vocals and that's done. There was no remixing, like, not like now. Um, but dang it, I don't fuck out what you were asking. What the hell? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. no, I would say, cause I think you was answering the least cause you was like about the whole analog and digital thing and how Naughty sounds very analog. Sorry, yeah, that's what it is. So there wasn't that much, there weren't many electronic instruments on Naughty. Like everything was very analog. Yes. What you're going to do for me started to bring that in, but in a way that like Off the Wall does, where it takes those things and does them very soulfully. Whereas 
um, I feel for you was like, yeah, there's electronic instruments, there's like scratches, there's DJs, there's big beats and, and drum machines, but it's commercial on purpose. And I think Shaka tolerated, I feel for you. Um, there's a song on there called My Love is Alive, this a cover of somebody else's song. And it's a very soulful song. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could want to do that in more of a way that you would have expected on a Rufus album or one of her previous albums, because she likes soul music. And she, like, that's how she works. Um, but they took that song and they, they just made it very 1984. And just production wise, I think they took their song and did what they wanted to it. And she's like, look, just cut me a check. <laughs> it's fine. You know, I just want to sing my song. Y'all do whatever you got to do. Cause like she would sing the songs, do albums and would keep it moving. I think there was like two, uh, two years between I feel for you and the next album. Otherwise, yeah, she was just moving all the time. That's what me and Elise was talking about too. It seemed like I was like, Naughty had just came out in like March of 80. And then you bring out, what you gonna do with me in April of 81? I'm like, damn, you didn't even let it breathe. And Sean Khan like, came out in 78. Right. I mean, it wasn't just 78, 80, 81. Yeah. But then she came Shaka out. Khan albums were coming out at the same time as Rufus. So yeah. it was definitely no breathing. <laughs> she had two record labels like hawking her for like, okay, you know, being the studio doing this, being the tour doing that. And and she's raising kids at the same time. I'm glad mama has her good sense today. They tried to kill my girl, and I don't appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That's rude. <laughs> rude. Just rude. Very rude. So nasty. So rude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So. Oh, we didn't even talk about our worst, though. Our least. Oh. We're going to ask. Just get it over with. Let's go. Come on, let's I, go. I, Yes. Yes, Mark. Wait. Who? Wait. We may ask Mark last. What's yours, the least? <laughs> I bet you better not. I bet you better don't. <laughs> I hope it ain't mine. A favorite song of mine. What is it? Father, he said. <gasps> oh, wait a minute. You mean on the album? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> I, okay. I just realized that's actually my favorite song on the album. Because of the heat that came up when you said that. <laughs> so now I need to understand why you don't like Bobby said, I need to understand, make it clear. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't or, or, like or, or, it. Which pieces of it don't you like? Because sometimes it's like, uh, that doesn't all work for me. I just, you know, it's not even of disliking. I just don't connect with it. It, I skip it a lot Holy when I'm okay. listening. Because I listen to this all the way through, but that's my one skip song. That is so interesting. That's So I've run this album into the ground, gotten tired of it, and then come back. Then gotten tired of it and come back, because that's how my life works. But when I'm tired of it, that's like the only song I listen to. It'll be like, he, Heed the Warning and Father He Said, and then I'll come back to the rest of it when like I've, I've had a break. That's amazing, though. I'm asking more questions about this. I do album. love Heed the Warning. Huh? There's so many great songs, though. Like, I, I actually wonder, like, this is a good question, like, why people don't like certain songs. Did you want to mm -hmm. do yours, JR, or what? What's yours, JR? Junior? Hmm. And the melody still lingers on. I'm not gonna cry on camera. <laughs> I don't, y'all. I don't. I'm gonna be strong. You ain't gonna break me <laughs> with this bullshit. You know what? Cause you a hateful. <laughs> I don't like the begin. I don't like the beginning of that song, but I like the rest of it. We love know, the I, rest of it. Maybe I love maybe. the beginning of the song, but I'll be honest. I feel like the beginning is somewhat out of time. Like, I know how the baseline of Night in Tunisia goes. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure Herbie Hancock was playing it right. But for some reason, it just seems like it's out of, like, out of time with the keyboard line. I'm like, did somebody, like, like take the sync of, uh, like, what the hell? How come I can't speak? 
there's somebody like take the tape and like have it out of sync or something because it's just it's weird but like i just love the way the sounds come together so i just i ignore it i i, I rock with it i'm sorry yeah I, that I, and it, it comes right after one of my favorite songs too because it's the first it's the first song on the B side. We had the cassette. So yes. So, <laughs> so it's the first song. So I'm hype off of, you know what I'm saying? Off of we got each other. And then this comes and I'm like, maybe that, like Mark said, maybe it's Herbie Hancock nope. playing that keys. I'm not on it. Like, it's just... Are you not huge on jazz? Cause that's fair too. No, I do like jazz. And that's why it's weird because I'm like, I like other versions of this song, but it's this so, this version of Shockers I just don't like. I don't know why. And I was trying today when I was at work and I was just like, why? Like, come okay. on. Like, I want to like this. This will probably been the only one that I don't like. Other than that, you can play this album through for me. But well, you know, part of this is like I love this album so much. It does not occur to me how one could not like that song. Um, I, I just don't see like a part of it like where you'd be like, oh yeah, you know, everybody loves my kids. Oh wait, they are kind of bad sometimes. All right, maybe you don't like. It. <laughs> like I don't see anything about my kid that you can dislike. <laughs> that said, my least favorite. This is weird though. All right, it's it's any old Sunday. <gasps> Only because, and, and this is the weird thing about it. Uh, it's the slowest song on the album. I actually clocked the tempos of every every song, and it's the slowest song on the album. So like, you get, of course uh, you did. I live you, and like you're doing this, you're up, and like all of these songs are rhythmic. Like she's she's in it. And and like I get to, I'm like, okay, I wasn't ready for a nap. I guess, all right, fine, I'll two step with this. But usually I skip it because I don't want to come down, and it's the downest the album gets. Okay, I, I, I can I can understand that. So what I usually do is I move it somewhere else in the track listing. Like I, I can listen to it towards the end because like if it comes right after like maybe or maybe right before i know you i love you the reprise like that's already kind of like without you i stumble it's like it's all chill and whatnot yeah. like so if i'm in a um, in a chill mood or maybe like after night mood or something um i just i usually don't want to stop and and take the time to listen to any old sunday it's like like the wise um grandma that always has something good to say but she like but grandma i'm outside playing i don't want to stop <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, like, I feel shady saying that because I met the writer and got to have a conversation with her. Um, but the McCrary's actually did that song first, and um, they're related to so many people. And so, like, I was at something, um, well, like, you know, my friend is married to one of the McCrary's, and I'm like, I'm at a table, and this woman introduces herself as, I think it was Linda McCrary that I was talking to. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I had to like take my starstruck and pull it down. Like, all right, you're talking to someone who wrote a song on what you're going to do for me. Do not freak the hell out. But like, no, she was cool. And she was just, you know, vibing to music and whatnot. And I asked her a couple of songs, a couple of things about the song. She said the session was really cool with Shaka. Um, I think they might even be, sing be singing on it as well. But um, it's just ironic that that is like the, the song that I geek out about the least. And that's probably the only writer that I have met. Wow. <laughs> that And I like that song so much because it reminds me of Get Ready, Get Set from Naughty. It has the same vibe to me. That's you why I love it. So anytime I sing that, I'll be like, get ready, get set. <laughs> get Ready, Get Set is so slick to me. That was my skip on Naughty for a long time. Now it makes sense. <laughs> but now that I think about it, though, like it was a single from Naughty. And I'm yeah. like, well, why is this a single? No, I, I know why. Because like for the time, like it's it's like splitting the difference between like soft rock, adult contemporary radio. Yeah. Like if you want to get some of that Barry Manilow money, you would have a song like that. Yep. Um, and like it's not so uh, so sexy, so soulful that, you know, the you know, the white audience would be like, eh, it's too spicy. I can't rock with this. 
you yeah. know, you can you can get with like get ready, get set, and it won't stop the party if you have this plan at that, you know, at your car party or at the at the family reunion or something. Like it was just black enough, but it was real chill. Um it, but it's that kind of thing. Did you know there's another version of it though? It is? Mm-hmm. When they put that out on the seven inch, it's actually longer. And they have a breakdown on there that's not on the album. Really? But I YouTube? didn't like rock with the song like that. So I was like, oh, you know, I was collecting records and I finally got the Naughty single just because it was a single from Naughty. And so I'm listening. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is not how the album goes. First of all, it starts off with doom, doom, doom. I'm like, wait a minute. That's not how the album goes. It's totally a remix. And they didn't say so. They just tried to optimize the song so it would do better on radio. And I forget what the chart position was, but I actually prefer the single version on, on the 45 to the one on the album. Wow. I can't remember the song. Is it on YouTube? It probably is, but it, I mean, you'd have to find it. Although, if you go by the time codes or whatever, it's, let's see. I don't know if it's on here. Damn. I did not know that. And I love that song. <laughs> well, it's weird, though, because it's, yeah, that's almost again like a remix, but they just didn't say anything. And I feel like that album also needs uh, like a special edition. So on the album, it's 356. Yeah. On the single, it's probably like four minutes and eight, 10 seconds or whatever. See, you can tell what kind of geek I am. If you find a version that's four minutes, that's probably the one on YouTube. That's the one on YouTube. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> there is no special edition. I make my own. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thank you, iTunes. Oh, right. So now we're gonna we're gonna do a little 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 game that we play at the end of our show, and it's a word association game. Oh boy! <laughs> or I give you category. Just roll with it. So the answer or the word you associate must be a song by Shaka Khan. It can also include Rufus stuff. Just it, anything that Shaka's involved in, in any kind of way. Okay, mm. a song. Okay. Okay. Word association. So we're going to do five, okay? Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> just the first thing that comes to your mind. It's not, you know, just whatever, okay? Cover. Uh, cover. Uh, why am I going blank? There's so many covers. The end of a love affair. Nice. All right. Love. You All My Lifetime is my favorite song from The the Woman I Am. And I wanted to do it live so bad. No, he was going to see that. <laughs> Why did I not? Okay. Listen, listen, though. Uh, this song was so amazing to me. And it's like one of those songs that's like danceable, but it's sad as hell. So as hell. Like, like if you're oh. ever actually going through anything, don't listen to that. You'll think it's over. You know, they ain't never coming back. I'm gonna be alone for the rest of my life, but I'm gonna dance the whole time. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, you ain't lying because I've done it with that song a couple of years ago. Yeah. You know, just crying two step. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, you know I was. <laughs> Bless oh. y'all's heart. I'm sorry. The second one. Whatever. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Sexy. Oh. Tell me something good, but I can't hear that song and hear like I got something that will show up, set your stuff on fire, and not think was that VD? Hell, somebody. Anyway, <laughs> gotta love my. I swear to God, <laughs> get your friend. Get your friend. Can't say I know the guy. God, God. We have pictures together. You can't deny me now. <laughs> about to scrub the internet. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Dance. Um, Life is a Dance, which ironically was a song that was too slow for me to dance to. It is. Yeah, it's. That's it was interesting... like it was a jam, like it was a not a slow jam, but like it was it was a it's different like of a groove. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of what they did to to that song on the on the life is a on that. Okay, so 
As far as that remix project, yeah. I think in honor of Shaka, I just generally don't acknowledge it. She did not sign off on that. She did not want those remixes. Um, it's just something they put out like to uh, to keep product happening. And I'm sure, you know, if she made money from it, she's cool. Like I'm sure some of the songs in there she wrote, like I know you, I love you. Um, and I do like the way they remix um, "Slow Dancing," but in general, just that period of house music, I wasn't in love with. It was too slow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yes, just Shaka wasn't in love with it. I'm not in love with it. So like, I'm. I think I have some of the remixes, but I I don't acknowledge that. That that's Warner, and 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 I still have the. I'm sorry, it's pushing. <laughs> no, no, that's fair. That's yes. very fair. <laughs> All right, sample on site. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm sorry. What was the word? Sample. Oh, through the fire. <laughs> Because of what Kanye did to it, and you know, it's probably still on shot <laughs> on site with Shocker. Because he's like, anytime um, they mention that that song, did you see any of the interviews she did recently um, promoting the fact that they did a reissue of the the greatest hits part of Epiphany? No. So, like in in one of the interviews, they asked her about um, the way Kanye like reinterpreted through the fire, and Shock was just like, "Ugh, I hated that." And, and if I'd have known he was going to do that, I wouldn't have okayed it. And I think the, the interviewer was just like, oh, okay. You know, it's like, but again, that's, that's no, that's no uh, new thing. Like she said that before. Yeah. But someone else asked and Shaka was just kind of like, you don't want me to answer that and moved on. <laughs> I, I don't love the original. I don't, I don't love through the five, through the five. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't like slow songs for the longest time. So there was a whole bunch of shocker that I didn't come to appreciate until I got older. Mm. Now, the technical ability for her to do a song like Through the Fire, the way she did it, and then like, can, can't nobody hardly come behind her. Like, I think Kelly Price did a respectable version of it, like, because she had the range. But like, even hers can't replace shocker. It's amazing. But then hearing that um, Saida Garrett actually did the demo on that, and she's like, oh, yes, yeah, like, uh, um, I think some of the things that she's saying, because she's like, oh, this is for Shaka, I know exactly what to do. So that's why on the demo, she's singing through the fire, the way Shaka would, instead of not, not through the fire. Because they tried to fix that from the demo. She's like, no, no, no. If you're singing this to Shaka, it has to be this way, because she knows how Shaka does a song. Right. It was amazing the way she did it and the way it came out. But I heard that song so much in 1984 and 85. I really never need to hear it again. You sound like me <laughs> in a concert. I'll be like, thank you. Like, it's a beautiful song, but I've just, it's been 30, 40 years. I'm good. Yeah. yeah and yeah. And it's not so much that I don't like it or I don't get it. It's it's that reason. It, well, it's it 80s, got, big, cheesy. And, and I'm like, I just had a certain amount for those songs and that wasn't it. L listen, though, if I can go back and I could have turned stronger than before into what um, Through the Fire became. Like, I don't know why that song wasn't a single. It's like, it's like the Through the Fire that nobody knows about that's hidden on that I Feel For You album. And if people heard it, they'd be like, oh my God, what the, is this? Mm -hmm. I just, oh, Jesus. But they push, they, you know they push Through the Fire so much. Yeah. It's like, ugh. And I, 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 I ain't gotta hear that song ever again. <laughs> I don't want to be like, oh, that song is trash. It's not. It's yeah, just no, it's, it's not. Been, it's been played to death. And okay. like, again, I love what it did for her. I love the way she did it. It's a beautiful song, but I'm just, I just never need the place that it occupies in my life. And and stronger than before, just it does for me what Through the Fire does for everybody else. So hey, everybody's happy. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, get shady parts of this and be like, see, that's not a real Shaka fan. I don't know, <laughs> you. I don't know what both y'all do. Nah. <laughs> so with you knowing now that Shaka is being nominated in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think, how do you feel? Do you think she's going to get in this time? I think that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has a problem with anybody who's not a technically rock artist. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they bend and, and shape the rules as they want to. Um, it's usually, I feel like it has less um, pushback for, for white artists, but that's just like a, a fact of America, basically. Yeah. She's been nominated for the last six, seven years. 
I can't help but think that every time Shaka hears that she's been nominated for the Rock Hall of Fame, she gives you one of these. Okay, thank you. You know, um, because I think it's like if there was a big push on her, or they were doing a big documentary or something. Um, like I, I hope De Dionne Warwick gets in because she is definitely having a year where people are just like, you know, looking back into her career again and realizing, oh, this is why Dionne is amazing. So it's not like she has never deserved to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because really it should just be the Music Hall of Fame with the people that they're honoring. It's not just rock. So it can't just be white. It can't just be like a certain type of people. Like you just learn to share people. Like I, I, I'm telling you, um, <clears throat> sorry, a little angry. But uh, with Shaka, I feel like every year she gets nominated, but <clears throat> if she has a year like Dionne Warwick where she's just really on people's minds or they're really appreciating a previous album, or somebody else comes through and looks like, oh my God, I just grew up listening to Shaka Khan and, and like this is how I end up being this amazing. And we're like, oh wow, let's pay attention to Shaka. When things come together with, with, the, with the promotion, then I'm sure she'll get into the Rock Hall of Fame because she has, God, 11 Grammys um, across jazz, uh, rock, pop. I mean, she's, she's done gospel. The things she's done in jazz, like, that's like separate from from like all the R and B stuff. Like she has respect in so many areas. It's not like the Music Hall of Fame would be embarrassed to have her. So I don't know why they're being like, uh, you know, it, it's a popularity contest. So I don't take it seriously. It's like on the years when the Grammy nominations are trash, you'd be like, all right, we're just we're just gonna go ahead and ignore that for now. Right, right. So yeah, I'm sure she'll get in at some point if they want to be respectable as an institution. In the meantime, it's, it's whatever it is. Um, I think we already know that we can't wait for them to honor us. That's all. Facts. Facts on that one. Yes. I agree. So, Mark, what you I got do? anything going on or any projects or anything on your mind you want to tell us about? Oh, well, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, I might be writing an article on what you're going to do for me, which is so hard because I'm trying to cram everything I love about the album into like an article that people would actually want to read, not just like, oh, listen to this one part. And every song has that one part. Listen, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. I mean, well, hopefully we got to help get you, you know, massaged you a little bit so you can articulate it in a different way, especially getting. Little other people's perspectives on it so i appreciate what y'all do for me you good people i shouldn't talk about y'all as bad as i do you sure shouldn't right can you edit that out so i don't sound like i don't like you <laughs> you, you do know who edits these videos correct right oh damn never mind we, you, no. you know it's not jr so <laughs> look when, when this joint get done i'm gonna have like the cat filter on my face i'll be like I, i'm not a cat your honor <laughs> 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 You're fired, dude. Um, no, but tell people where they can um, where they can find you if you want to be found. Well, uh, <laughs> on Twitter you can find me. I'm always on uh, Twitter.com/slash Mark Chappelle. That's M A R K C H A P P E L L E, like Dave Chappelle, but it's Mark. You might be related. I don't know. It's okay. I make my own money. Anyway, there's that or. Um, you can go to albumism.com and I've been writing there for the last maybe nine months or so. I love it so much because all the geeky stuff that I want to do on, on, uh, on all these artists, I'm getting a chance to like go through and just like explore, um, like who, who have I written out about so far? Tina Marie, mm -hmm. Theory. Um, I was just to say that Groove Theory. Oh, you know, of course. Um, gosh, I, I spent so much time with these, I kind of forgot. Oh, Layla Hathaway. I love Layla Hathaway's music. And I felt like I want to evangelize her because after all this time, she's still an underdog. How do you do that with five Grammys? Amazing. But um, yeah, I'm writing things about Shaka this year, um, Lisa Fisher, uh, SOS Band. Like, there's a whole bunch of people that I just love and I get to geek out about them and dig into like what makes those albums great. Mm. And so far, it seems like I'm fairly good at making it clear. It just takes a lot of time. So please read the articles, enjoy, comment on them, tell me about them. I love talking to people about music. So like, yeah, if you're like, yeah, I love that art. No, I hate that. I actually want to hear both of those opinions. So yeah. come see me. <laughs> yeah. Some of your friends were very encouraging and, um, and helpful on your... Yeah, but if only they were cute, it'd be great. 
What? What are we talking about? I don't understand. Ooh. But you know, I, I, uh, before you started writing for them, like I, it just felt in my heart like that was the perfect place for you because of mm-hmm. how you think about music and just the way your mind works generally. Yeah. Like I was like that. That is a beautiful merging. You no, know, it would have been great if you had helped me out with the initial pitch for that. <laughs> no, you know. But no. I didn't need you because I was born knowing how to pitch an article to to an outlet. So <clears throat> if you need some help, you can come to me. Oh, wait a minute. Am I lying? I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much for the help. And yes, you're cute. <laughs> you know, I was being too nice the whole interview. I had to insert some releaseness in there. I know. Keep I it know. authentic. It's part of what I love. So I got the whole time. Are they going to have you write something about Luther soon? You know, that could happen. Let's see it, though. Oh, boy. (laughs) So, look, I tend to write about artists that I absolutely love, not just artists that I respect. Catch that one. Catch that. Catch that. That's our our catch that moment. It came all the way at the end. Right. Oh man. But yeah, thank you for coming and hanging out with us. We were yeah. so excited about it. Yes, we were. I'm honored to because again, like you had Keith Murphy on here and then you had Zoe. And so like it doesn't matter what happens, I'm really gonna be feeling myself for like the rest of the year. You're oh. <laughs> gonna be able to tell me nothing. Like can we you, now? Like, Mark, you can I I I I I was on Catch That and you know Zoe was on there, right? You can see Keith Murphy. <laughs> Okay, I'm just saying, because, you know, like, you, you can't, nah. <laughs> you can tell me Nathan. <laughs> yeah. You know, they just had, you know, Do a little song. Zoe or whatever. Or, yeah, just know, a little song. Murphy, you know. Yeah. Um, Trina Broussard. Trina Broussard, you know. Whatever. You don't invite anybody on here who's not, like, a huge music fan, so, like, I feel like I'm in great company with y'all, period, let alone everybody else. So this is, this is great for me. Like, I, I'm super honored. Y'all actually are a big deal, and people are just beginning to find out. So let them catch on. Hurry up. Oh, <laughs> I'll be trying to tell y'all, but y'all don't want to be listening. I, I will repeat it. <laughs> but yes, and this is, and, and for the audience, this is how we interact. Yeah. I, I feel like I was on my best behavior. Don't leak the other video of when we. Had, Really clever. All right, insert record scratch here. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm so glad that like you didn't invite any of the other INA crew because you know the more of us is on the Zoom call, the ridiculous is it's gonna get. Oh it's, my it's God. a word. It is now. It's gonna have a red squiggly line underneath it, but I'm gonna use it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, thank you again um, for hanging out with us and we like to thank our audience for rocking with us once again. So we will see y'all on the next episode of Catch That with the R&B representers. Hey. Hey. <laughs>